Great Fleet. It's an issue we've been tackling for a long time, and the title's not just there for amusement. It was really um, to make the point that in my 10 years plus in the fleet industry, I've heard every excuse of why people use their own car. Um, it, there is never a day goes by when someone else hasn't got a reason why they're not using a better solution. And what we have to try and do is change hearts and minds and get people to think in a different way. Just a bit of background who we are. Um, I work for the Environment Agency, but we do provide a fleet service to DEFRA Group. Um, that's as diverse as the National Parks, Kew Gardens, right the way through to ourselves, the Animal Health and Veterinary Services. Um, through Forestry Commission, a wide range of um, people that we now look after in terms of a fleet service. We have about 9,000 assets in our fleet. It's about 12,000 across DEFRA Group, different funding types. But what we have tried to do over the last 10 years, five years, is reduce both our costs, our carbon output, and also make sure we're as safe as we can be. And all the things you've heard this morning so far talk about safety, talk about emissions, talk about value for money. So we do believe that getting rid of the grey fleet where it's not appropriate hits all these targets. Just a, sort of a graphic picture there to show you the sorts of things that we deal with. That's got even more strange and bizarre. Um, we now have things like rabies vans on our fleet, um, which are interesting things to deal with. Um, agricultural equipment, that, um, forest harvesting and all sorts of other peculiar items. So we have quite a mixed fleet across DEFRA Group and some very unusual bits of equipment that we have to buy and maintain. So getting on to the kind of the meat of the subject, um, Toby asked me to kind of talk about not just where we're at but what we think are the benefits, disbenefits of how people use Grey Fleet. You know, I have to say to start with, there is a place for it. You know, we're not trying to get rid of it completely. Um, and the first point is, it's, it is the best mobility uh, solution for people who are travelling short distances, but are away for long durations. So the classic is, I drive to a train station to catch a train. You wouldn't leave a rental car there. You wouldn't use a pool car and leave it there. So your own vehicle makes sense in that case. You know, people find it convenient they like using their own car, they're comfortable with it, they know where all the switches are, it means they can get out in the morning much quicker. So we have to bear in mind that there is this convenience factor that people like. Talk about you know, work-life balance and how you can integrate that better. You know, we all know if someone's hiring a car, you know, for tax purposes they can't go and pick the kids up from school or go to the supermarket on the way home because of all the issues. So actually, it's another reason why people say, I need to use my own car. And we need to be aware of that when we start talking about solutions to don't, not, not taking away those things that allow work-life balance. We talk about personal fit. You know, people have a particular car sometimes because of a back issue or some other um, adaption they need for their vehicle, which you don't always necessarily get if you hire a car or use a pool car. So we need to be conscious of that, but not overly conscious in the sense that people will try and pull the wool over our eyes a bit so they can use their own car. So we need to make sure the vehicles we're getting are suitable and of a high quality. And again, the membership in front of me here will be able to do that for us. There are no issues that we have to deal with in terms of uh, damage to the vehicle. If it's your own vehicle, you damage it, you pay for it. Um, it affects your insurance. People probably are a bit more careful. Um, but you know, again, another advantage to, to the business and to the user is we don't have to worry about that sort of thing. You know, we all spend time dealing with fines and damage People using their own car, we don't have any of that. So, you know, again, there are some business advantages that people need to be, need to be aware of. There are some financial benefits. Um, depending on how much people have been paid and how much they're doing, there is a financial benefit. Andrew mentioned the, you know, the 70 mile cutoff. We use about 75 miles where if you do more than that, you um, have to go into a rental. And if you choose not to and you use your own vehicle, you don't get paid. You know, you get 75 miles and then you don't get paid for the rest of it. So we have to have some disincentives as well as incentives for people. You know, in employee relations, you know, in a, in a world where we've faced cuts since 2008, 2009, the same as everyone else, you know, fewer, fewer benefits in the workplace. And people see that 45p or in some cases 60p, whatever people are paying for Grey Fleet, 
as one of the few benefits that left, is left, and it helps employee relations. When you're talking about pay cuts, redundancies, people see that as something they still wish to keep. From a business perspective, there are serious issues, and, and Andrew's chart shows you the, you know, the quality of the, the vehicles on average that people are using, you know, and there are some serious issues around that. Um, we need to look how effective using those AMAT rates are. There are some organisations who pare it down to 25p a mile and make people claim it through their tax at the end of the year. Quite a difficult issue. Some government departments do do it, but it's quite controversial. You know, legal duty of care. We tried um, insisting people had breakdown cover and a service history when they used their own car. And it didn't go down well, and we were told not to do it, and the trade unions complained. You know, but we still have a duty of care. If somebody breaks down in their own vehicle on business in the middle of Bodmin Moor on four o'clock on a December night, we still have a responsibility, they're on business. So there is that difficulty where using your own vehicle puts us in a difficult situation. Emissions, you know, DEFRA are doing lots of work on air quality, how we can improve that, working with guys like yourselves to talk about how the industry can help us reduce carbon emissions, NOx emissions how we can improve air quality for everybody. And one of the things I would say is the Environment Agency and DEFRA, whilst people think it's about improving the environment, which it clearly is, it's also about improving the lives of people who live in the environment. You know, we, we're very conscious. It's not just about making that river greener uh, and not just about making air quality better. It's about the impact that has on people's lives. We want people to have the best quality of life and the environment helps them do that. Um, Reputational perspective, same with cash takers. You know, you could rock up in a 10-year-old Porsche. Is that the right image for your company? Equally, they could rock up in a 10-year-old Trabant. And you know, again, is that the right image for your company? So we need to be more and more concerned that we are leading by example and not allowing people to use vehicles that are not appropriate for the type of image and for the leadership issue of it. You know, we can't go and spout about how we think emissions are the most important thing if we're turning up in very highly polluting vehicles. You know, we have to lead by example. We have a travel pol uh, sorry, suitability of vehicles, another one. I mentioned before about the Porsche. We've had people in old Land Rovers. And again, it's the image thing, and not just that, the safety features of it. Some of these older vehicles are very poor on safety. And again, duty of care kicks in. If we know they're driving a vehicle that's not serviced regularly, that's very old, is very inefficient, we need to do something about that. We have a travel policy. Um, we're trying to revise that across the whole of DEFRA group, and Grey Fleet is a big part of that travel policy. We're hoping we'll get some ministerial sign-off uh, in the new year to make something more consistent and try and move people out of Grey Fleet into other solutions. And the biggest thing is, you know, one of the things we have to say to people is, if we can save even 10% of what we're paying, you know, the numbers are horrendous across, across the private and public sector. That protects jobs. Ultimately, when we have to make cost savings, if we're making it there, that's people's jobs. It's a very powerful message to get to people to say, we're trying to protect your interests here. We're not trying to be mean or, or all the rest of it. There is, a, there is a point to what we're trying to do here. These have all been mentioned. Um, I'm not gonna go into them in detail, more than to say, we don't believe there's a silver, I don't believe personally there's a silver bullet here for Grey Fleet. It's about a set of mobility solutions that suits your organisation, and they will be different. They will be very different. We're just moving into corporate car share now um, and replacing our pool cars with corporate car share. The model we're working up is for eventually that to be pan government. So anyone in government can book one of these cars, pick it up, drop it off, and it doesn't matter who you are, who you work for, it all sorts itself out. You know, massive step forward, but that will take some time. So we use all those combinations. Salary sacrifice hardly at all, uh, and we're just looking at the new rules about whether that is applicable to us or not. I mean, the great news in all this is that ULEVs are still part of salary sacrifice. So we think that's a great step forward. In terms of where we look like, I'd like to think that we're on the, you know, the right-hand side of the graph of what we're doing and what we're, we're planning on doing to get ourselves in the right place. Um, we've had a travel hierarchy in place for over 10 years. The plan now is to get that across DEFRA Group and get it across central government, actually. 
you know, the greenest mile is the one not travelled. And we don't always have to travel on the train, we don't have to be hair shirty about this, but sometimes public transport is the best option. Why would you drive into central London? Why would you drive into the middle of Manchester if you can get a different form of transport? You know, we have lots of mobility options. We think there's more out there. You know, the true mobility solution is some way off, but we're working with suppliers and people like yourself to try and see what that might look like. And there are lots of new and emerging solutions. You know, corporate car clubs have taken off in the last two, three years, and we should be using that technology better and smarter. We should make sure IT integrates with it so we can use it. So we just need to look at all the new technology and how it fits with us. I mentioned about incentives, you know, as well as the, the daily um, limit we have on people using their own vehicles, we also have an annual mileage cap, which is about 3,000 miles. Again, if you want to use your own car beyond that point, you don't get paid. And in some cases, if you don't get paid, you're not insured. Because if you're doing a journey for business and you're not claiming the money back for it, there are insurance issues with it. And actually, that's driven our Grey Fleet mileage right the way down. The important thing, I think, is about communicating success. You know, this is a difficult journey for a lot of people. They've been doing it for, in some cases, you know, 10 years plus. We need to let people know what this looks like in terms of success, what the benefits are to them as well as the organisation. You know, people listen sometimes about cost, sometimes about carbon, sometimes about safety. We need to trigger the right thing so that people actually start thinking, yeah, you're right, that works. I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to move over to that. Like all these things, it's a journey rather than a destination. It's not going to happen overnight. Central government is probably slower than the private sector. We are trying to shake that up a bit and try and get things moving a bit quicker. But that takes time, you know, cultural changes will dictate the pace. So the future, what does it look like? What are we all doing? Andrew mentioned a few bits and pieces. We now have a, a fleet, government fleet innovators group across central government and the first thing we're trying to tackle is Grey Fleet. Working with the industry and working with suppliers to get that solution out there. You know, you all, you all hold the key to the solution and we need to work with you to make that happen. We need to make sure that, you know, part of the driver for all this is making sure across government there are some consistent policies. You know, that will change and that will drive behaviours. And at the moment, they're a bit all over the place and we need to kind of harmonise those a bit, particularly in places like NHS trusts. You know, they're a big user of Grey Fleet. If we can try and harmonise across those groups, you know, we will make some success. I mentioned before about this kind of ambition to have a pan-government-wide car share scheme. Um, we're a way off. Some government departments are now looking at car share. When they're settled down in a year or two, we might be able to then start looking at the pan-government piece. But it is quite a challenge, quite a challenge. And I talk about you know, truly integrated mobility solutions. Um, again, some of your members have, in Europe, got some schemes where you can use a bike, a bus, a train, a car, and you use a single card for them all and you can drop one somewhere else and pick another one up somewhere else. So you can move around seamlessly at low cost and you don't have to keep booking different things and they're on different systems and different suppliers. You know, we're a long way off that and, and, and some of these schemes that are in place in Germany are, are almost pilot schemes. Um, but we want to, you know, that's the future where you can just use any form of transport to do your business. And it gets, you know, you pay for it in a simple way and it makes life a lot, a lot easier for you. And the last one is, you know, setting targets. You know, at some point in the future, we're likely to have air quality targets in fleets for NOx. You know, it will happen. I'm, I'm, I don't know when, but I can see it happening. Will there be targets about grey fleet? Will we be challenged with reducing that volume, reducing the average CO2, restricting the age of the vehicles people can use? You know, we want to get people to change so that if anything happens, we're in the kind of vanguard of change. Um, but that takes a lot of time and it needs a lot of support.